Good evening, every, <coughs> everybody, and thanks, Michael. Romans 8 is a remarkable chapter, isn't it? When you become immersed in the flow of Paul's language and see how it develops to grand and wonderful things. Even the intercession of Christ for us. The fact that the love of God, how can we be separated from the love of God? All those things which he lists. Because such great and wonderful things have been done for us by the love of God for us, by the love of Christ, which we see revealed so often and so wonderfully throughout Scripture. And I'm sure each of us, at those certain times in our lives when we rely more heavily on the intercession of the Spirit and of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives, whether it be in illness or in failure, We can praise God for such a wonderful blessing. Why this subject? I guess because I'd never really had a good look at it before. That's one reason. Um, I just assumed while the years went by that these words held, while these words held a certain um, curious fascination for me as to the breadth and the substance and how it all worked and all of those sorts of things, I had been content uh, with a simple view of trusting in heaven for me now, in the spirit, as his work emanates to fulfil the purpose of God in us, that his role in heaven renders for each one of us the benefit of his presence by the throne of grace, the highest power, the one in whom we are in relationship with through Christ, through grace. And that that help comes particularly to us to heal our spiritual insufficiencies in times of trouble and anxiety in our lives and in a way which is able to see past our faltering prayers and the insufficiency of our benevolence before God, who is able to read and search the mind of the Spirit in our hearts and so respond in ways which are unspeakable. And I'm still pretty happy with that view. Um, but see what you think as we go through the subject a little closer and have a look at the, uh, the context and the realities which come to life as we read through this chapter. It's important that when we look at uh, verse 26, uh, and verse particularly, we see that this is centred upon the healing of our infirmities. The word infirmities in the scripture, particularly in the New Testament, um, literally is on the want of our strength. The literal interpretation of the word infirmities in the Greek is our want of strength. And so we're really talking about our utter weakness before God in whatever manner that is uh, portrayed in our lives and our thinking. Our inability to produce the results to which we are called and which are envisaged for us and portrayed for us go plainly in scripture. Our incapability of being able to achieve these things. In uh, <coughs> Second Corinthians 11 and 12, the word is literally translated weakness or weaknesses. And in Romans 15, it's directly linked to a weakness in our faith. The strong must support the infirmities of the weak. And then it extends in Luke chapter 7 particularly to the word diseases, the relationship between the physical frailties of the flesh called also by that term the infirmities. We often talk about, don't we, the infirmities of our flesh and how true that is. 
The word intercession is interesting, I suspect, um, being the active word in our considerations tonight. Whenever the word inter or the uh, conjunction inter is in a word, it's talking about the connection between two stations, between ideas. And the word session, convincing with a, a letter C, not a letter S, the session part of the word means to seed, to give up of our rights or our status or our position. And so immediately we can see the word inter and session coming together in the sense of coming between two stations, the bringing of things together. The Young's Concordance says of the word in the Old and the New Testament that it is to meet with or to meet between. And Vines has an interesting slant and says that it means to light upon, to bestow upon, to bring some change of position, to meet, to meet with. And so we can see here that what we are considering in a very special way here is the work of Christ and the Spirit of bringing together those that are set apart in a very special way, which the context of Romans 8 helps us with. Back in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 53, of course, that wonderful chapter which talks of the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, right in the last verse there it says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Prophecy of the great work and role of our Lord Jesus Christ in offsetting the power of our transgressions that we might be brought in to that acceptable relationship with he that is holy. In Isaiah 59, uh, there's another one a little later on, um, here uh, in this reference, uh, which is a reference largely to the sinfulness of the people um, in transgressing and lying against the Lord, in departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering uh, from the heart words of falsehoods and judgments that turned backwards and justice which stands afar off, when truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot, cannot enter, speaking here of the, the description of the state of the, um, of the people at that time, where truth faileth, and he hath departed from evil. He that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, a byword. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Verse 16, and he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. There was no way that, we could, that these things could be brought together of themselves. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. And so again, we have this uh, portrayal in this part that the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is he uh, uh, heavy that it cannot hear, but it was the iniquities of the people, verse 2, that had separated. Again, that thought of division, which the process of intercession was to heal. Jeremiah, following on from our talk last Sunday night um, in chapter 7, uh, gives us another indication of its use in the Old Testament. Um, uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 7, uh, where the uh, waywardness of the people had been, uh, was being discussed. Um, verse 13, And now because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early in the morning, but you would not hear. And I called you, and you wouldn't answer. 
Therefore I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole house of Ephraim. Therefore pray not for this people, neither lift up, cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. And so I think in that reference we can see that there's a separation again brought about by the unwillingness of the people to live within the grace and mercy of the Father and his provision. And because they were so wayward and unrepentant, uh, they reached a stage in which it was pointless Jeremiah even praying for them. Make no intercession to me for them, for I'll not hear thee. And so we can see the other side, that in the wisdom and the judgment and justice of God, we can reach a position where intercession is impossible until there is repentance, contrition, and the plea for forgiveness. In chapter 36, um, there's another reference there, um, which is of a similar note. There was uh, verse 25. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Gerar had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, <coughs> but he wouldn't hear them. A very uh, an incidental reference, if you like, but the use of the word there in the same context as we read earlier in Jeremiah. The word plead, that concept of pleading to God, is not a New Testament word. Um, it's not a word which finds any equivalent in the Greek, in the original. And the word to reason or negotiate, which you might attribute, for instance, to the intercession of Moses on behalf of the people, in the wilderness is also not a concept in the New Testament. The gospel of Christ and the salvation of God is set within rules and is our part to bow in obeisance to the God of all the earth and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to come to him in the way which is prescribed. There are no deals done in heaven. There's no negotiation. First Timothy chapter 2 uh, is another interesting start for us, I think. Um, we can see here that Paul exhorts all of us to... <coughs> First of all, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, the kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. Uh, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is but one God and one mediator between God and men. Christ Jesus, who gave his life a ransom for all. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so we can see here that um, our doubting, um, or our, yeah, our doubting has no, no part in prayer. It has to be done as an act of faith. And that wrath or anger has no part in prayer. Prayer, therefore, first of all, be offered up with supplications and intercessions and the giving of thanks. And so we have this thought right through Scripture, really, of the meeting between, the making peace, and the appeasement between uh, the two sides, in which, as we find in other Scriptures, um, there is enmity state of enmity between. The Son of God in Matthew 
says that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, to lay down his life for his fellow man. A life of service, a life of submission, a life of sacrifice. That appeasement may be made between the two sides, the side of the flesh and the side of the spirit. When we come to Ephesians uh, chapter 2, Verse 13. But now Christ Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And so again we see this concept of coming together, of intercedence through the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. The making of peace between the two sides. Who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us and abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And so here we have that concept again of the broader work of God's salvation, of God's intercession in the state of things between man and and himself between death and sin and life and righteousness. Over in Hebrews chapter 7, uh, at verse 23, we see the role of Christ starting to uh, arise more powerfully. Um, verse 23 and he's speaking here of the order of uh, the priest after the order of Melchizedek verse 19 the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw near unto God and so the coming forth of the Lord Jesus Christ from God to fulfill the law brought for us a better hope which enables us to draw near to God rather than to separate us as uh, so much of the law did and remind us of our sin. And so again we have this notion of being drawn together in a process of intercession. Verse 23, and they truly were many priests, here he's talking about the Aaronic priesthood, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man continued because he continues forever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save to the uttermost, to save completely those that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He is the mediator of the new covenant, the medium, the agency, if you like, through which the intersection ta intercession takes place. The meeting, the drawing together, takes place, the process by which we can be drawn nearer to God. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as the priests uh, did to offer up sacrifice, first for his sins and then for the people. For he did this once, when he offered up himself. The law maketh men uh, high priests which have infirmity. But though by the word of the oath, the new covenant uh, of salvation and faith, um, God hath made the Son who is perfected forevermore. Romans 8 comes, of course, in this wonderful work by the Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Um, grand logical discourse of God's righteousness and plan and process with, of salvation. 
uh, for mankind. Uh, the, you know, the fundamental truths of salvation just ooze out of uh, Paul's writings here in Romans. The workings of it. And, of course, the process of God's dealings with men to that glorious end uh, which is prescribed before the world began through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 26, then talks about the fact that the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings that can, cannot be uttered. And, and he searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And again, over in verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Uh, yea, rather, he that is written again, for, in, for even for who, he, who is even, sorry, at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. And so in the earlier verses, we have uh, Paul's writings indicating that it is the Spirit that makes intercession, clarified for us in verse 34 that that is centred in Christ. Christ who maketh intercessions for us at the right hand of God. Romans 6, of course, as we know, uh, deals so familiarly with the process of our release from sin. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, says Paul. Indeed, God forbid can't even be considered. It's out of the question. The power of repentance and confession and baptism and forgiveness the rising up of the new life to a new life as a new creature in Christ, dead to sin, alive to righteousness, sworn disciple, as it were, of the, the Lord Jesus Christ by adoption, becoming sons and daughters of him. That's the theme, the beginning of the theme, as it were, um, more intensely as we... Uh, enter upon the discourse which precedes chapter seven, uh, chapter 7 and 8. That we should walk in newness of life. And chapter 7 identifies for us the struggle which we all suffer and hopefully endure as we try to live in the spirit rather than be subject to the law of sin and death in our members, which he talks about uh, in the context of the chapter. But in Romans 8, Paul paints for us the grand picture of our freedom in Christ, if so be that we walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus quite the opposite to the law of sin and death which condemns us and which bears us down and burdens us without hope. Verse four, uh, through to verse 4. For what the law could not do, that it was weak in the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and that's the subject of Paul's continuing dialogue for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace the dichotomy because the carnal mind is enmity against God for he's not subject to the law of God neither indeed can it be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God that's that's one station but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so we see that Paul deals with this separation which must occur in our life, that we must be alive in the spirit, that the spirit of God might dwell in us. If any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you... Uh, the body is 
be in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit of life because is life because of righteousness. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And we see, as we work through the chapter, that the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are brought together in one purpose. We see Paul brings together both of these, both working in us towards our salvation, our justification in righteousness as a wonderful unity of purpose and persuasion and workmanship in our lives. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away, but and behold, all things are become new. And so for us in Christ, there is a change of allegiance. Our persuasion of things is completely different. Our outlook is changed, our tastes and our aims, our ambitions certainly represent an altered disposition which is completely against the flesh. We are raised up with Christ to sit with him in heavenly places. And so we find that this is more than just a meeting, this is an indwelling. The process goes beyond just meeting. But Christ comes and dwells within us. Bullinger says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that a divine spirit dwells in you. But if any man has not a Christ-like spirit, he is none of his. God has revealed himself in his Son. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And so we see that oneness between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, the divine spirit and the Christ-like spirit. And so in us, there must be that family likeness, mentality and moral behaviour for all those who would dwell in the house of God, in whom Christ will dwell. And so we've been brought into that wonderful relationship for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, brought into that most intimate and close relationship with the Almighty, the God of the universe, omnipotent, all-powerful, and wonderful meeting and rising up together, which is the work of God, which is the work of Christ. We become joint heirs, verse 17. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that ye suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so, Paul then says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not, to be, not worthy to be compared with the glory which is set before us, which shall be revealed in us. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. There is a baited expectation for the fulfilment of all these things, for the revealing of the glory in us, who are the heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath accepted us, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from bondage of corruption into a glorious liberty of the children of God. That's what awaits us. In contrast to the groaning and travail which we see around us in creation. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies and don't we groan brethren and sisters as we as we wait for the coming of our redemption 
of the revelation of Christ in reality, in our whole being, in that glorious confirmation when we shall enjoy that wondrous liberty as children of God in the time to come. And so he says, but not only they, but we ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, within ourselves, speaking of that contest, if you like, that anguish, that anxiety, which goes on in each one of us as we seek to find release from the oppression of sin and our weakness and our infirmities in our lives, that we truly might live in the Spirit and that we might enjoy eventually the fullness of Christ, the fullness of God to be revealed in us. It's an amazing concept, isn't it, that we find in the expression of those words. O wretched man that I am, says the Apostle Paul, for when we would do good, evil is present with us. So frustrated can we be with ourselves. I don't know whether you're like me sometimes when things just seem to happen. And, you think, oh. and so often there is that private despair um, which overcomes us and we have that sense of unworthiness and indeed a sense of fear when we consider the holiness of God the holiness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfection to which we are to be drawn to, to which we are to be made perfect in the time to come. When we consider the suffering of those things which we endure in our flesh day by day and those episodes where our suffering, you know, in having to make that choice which... Jesus made, that he would be in part his father's business also, comes and descends on us. And sometimes we find it's too powerful for us. And so we sink back into our infirmity, in despair. Winston Churchill in the middle of the war said, success is being able to take one failure after another without losing enthusiasm for the win." which is, I think, something which we could well imbibe into our lives as day by day we find ourselves submerged in our inadequacy, in our infirmities. Paul declares that in Christ we have been quickened, made alive, brought, risen from the dead in Christ, Previously, we've been dead in trespasses and sins, but in Christ we are made alive. It's the spirit that quickeneth, he says in John 6. The words that I speak, they are spirit and life. God is the speaker. The word is that which is spoken, and the spirit is the means by which those words become active. And this was in Christ. And that word lives and abides in us. And so we have within us that wonderful blessing, that strength of the power of God through his word <coughs> abiding in us to do his good pleasure, to do those good works which have been foreknown, predestinated for us before time that we should work in, walk in them. And so there is set before us this hope, verse 25, for that we see not. If we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And verse the previous verse, for we are saved by hope. And so even though we are not achieving, nonetheless the hope is set before us. And it is that hope and our faith in the work of Christ within us and the determination we have to follow in his paths and in his way that we place our faith and our trust in and our belief that indeed 
we shall see it, that our hopes will materialise. If we hope for what we see not, then do with patience wait for it. And so, whilst we will be like Christ, for the time being, we must wait. We must wait patiently for it. We must continue to believe in strong faith in those things which we know to be real but are not seen. Verse 26, Paul says, So likewise, in a similar way, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. It's an invisible process. We can't turn on the telly and see Jesus by the Father interceding for us or whatever. And so in the same way as we hope and we believe and we trust in the reality of our hopes, so we should be secure in the fact that the Spirit helps our infirmities. We are not alone, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit also maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he searches that searches the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit understands what is needful for us because he makes intercession with the saints according to the will of God to bring us in a way in which we cannot fully appreciate which is in the realm of the reality of our hope Paul says in that certainty we shall find that the intercession of the spirit for us will similarly come to great result within us. He that searches the spirits or the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Christ is at the right hand of God and also maketh intercession for us. When we consider, brethren and sisters, the grand hopes and the prayers which the Apostle Paul made for us in Ephesians, we haven't got time tonight to go through them, but when you get home, spend a little time and just read Ephesians 1, 2 and 3 the glories which await us and the power of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of grace through faith, that, you know, the wonder which Paul anticipates and is so boldly able to pray for, for us, words which we could barely utter uh, of ourselves. Yet we see there the wonder of the boldness, the confidence of the Apostle Paul, as he prays that Christ may dwell in our hearts and that we may be rooted and grounded in love and be able to comprehend with all saints the grand concept of our salvation, the grand concept of the love of Christ and to know that love which passes knowledge that we might be filled with all the full, fullness of God and to believe that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or anything that we can think of beyond our imagination and he does that by that same power which works in us when we talk about groanings the word literally means narrow we might think it's uh, somebody having a terrible time and can't help uttering those depressed and terrible groanings and moanings. The word actually means narrow, as in a pass between two cliffs. The English equivalent is to straighten or to constrain. Hence the terms the straight gate and the narrow way. The spirit's groaning conveys the idea of centering us, of focusing us and 
correcting us and motivating us towards greater likeness of our Saviour, the greater likeness of Christ. To be able to count all things as unimportant, as loss and of no consequence that we might win Christ. Centering us in a way through the spirit which, given our infirmity and all those things through which we fail, our normal incapacity, given those things, we would not possibly be able to attain. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 says that the love of Christ constrains us. It's the same word. They could have probably put groans us, but that's the impact of the meanings of the words. The love of Christ which constrains us, which binds us to him, brings us into that relationship where Christ may dwell in us and we may live and abide in Christ, in love, which is revealed in our obedience and our faithful endurance, in the fellowship of his sufferings, whatever they are in life. Probably the major one being the impact of denying ourselves. Which our brother in his writing on the book of Ephesians calls the forgotten doctrine. We're pretty good at all the rest, but we like to forget that one. It's such a simple concept. It's the symbol of Christ's sacrifice for us. And yet when it comes to reality in our own life, it's too hard. And so we must endure in the fellowship of his sufferings, denying ourselves. We believe that Jesus guides and guards us. We pray to the Father that he will lead us away from temptation and sin, that he will be with us, that he will work, walk with us along the way, that he will keep us within the narrow way, and we should have no doubts. He says yes. And through the Spirit, through words which cannot be uttered, he works in us to bring about that glory which shall be revealed unto us in the days to come. It's inconceivable to take that popular view, I think, of Christ's intercession with the Father in an inarticulate language which, um, you know, is hard to understand. <coughs> Rather, I think it is like in the case of Paul in the heavenly realm when Paul was caught up into the paradise in that wonderful vision that he heard unspeakable words which he was not authorised to take hold of and to pass on to others. Words of power of the invisible working out of the purpose of God and the sustaining of his children. We are talking about holy things beyond our perception in the working of the Almighty of which Jesus is part. We can think of the voice of God which came distinctly to Jesus from heaven in response to his request that the Father should glorify his name in John 12. Actual words that were spoken to Jesus which he understood, but for those around it was just the sound of thunder. And so these things are too wonderful for us. But the Apostle Paul says they are real. They are as real as the hope of salvation which is such a power and a force in our life, in our faith. We read in Hebrews 5 that Jesus in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him, heard, was heard that he feared. And in our prayers and our personal supplications, in the midst of all our trials and sufferings, our personal anguish, this no doubt is the key to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. Jesus was heard in that he, fe he feared, even though he was the son. Yet, in the might and before the glory of God, the presence of the angels, 
he feared him that was able to save him. In John, we have the Lord Jesus to his disciples in that terrible time before his suffering, before the Last Supper, or after the Last Supper. Let not your hearts be troubled, for in his absence he was going to prepare a place for them in the Father's house. There is the care and the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read it so often, but it's a real and vibrant and tangible thing. He's not on a holiday. He just hasn't gone up to pick up the package and come back with a key. He is preparing a place for us, an everlasting place for us, in the Father's house. He's doing it now, today, step by step. In four, John 14, 13 to 14, Whatsoever you ask in my name, the name of Christ, God shall save. It's all about God and his salvation through Christ and our response to him. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Ask and you shall receive that my joy may be full. Jesus delights in being useful in our salvation. It's what he's all about. It's what his whole life of sacrifice was about. For this person, the reason he came into the world. You shall ask in my name, interestingly, but I say unto you, I will not say that I will pray unto the Father for you. I think there's a little indication here that Jesus is saying that it's not a case of our prayers going to Jesus and he presenting them to the Father and having a good old chin wag about what we do about it. You shall ask in my name, in the covering of the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will... Uh, I will not say that I will pray to the Father for you, he says, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And so we pray, our Father, which art in heaven, that we might overcome our weakness. And there is in heaven God and the Lord Jesus Christ who invested so much since the world before the world began to ensure that none of us whom God had given to the Lord Jesus Christ shall be lost. And so he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which is beyond understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. The shepherd, the guider, and the overseer of our being. He makes us to lie down in green pastures and leads us by still waters. He restores our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though we each walk through the valley of death, we should fear no evil, for he is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us, for he anoints our head with oil, the oil of gladness, and our cup overflows with his goodness. And so, should we doubt, we shall dwell in the house of God forever. For each of us now, we should in love and fear come near with confidence under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need because it's there.